Let me now turn to Mr. Vitor Constancio. Uh, we are very grateful that, uh, to have him uh, and, and glad to have him here at Bocconi University today. Uh, Mr. Constancio has had an amazing career as a distinguished economist and uh, as a, a top policy maker in uh, various roles. Uh, let me just uh, briefly mention the main uh, steps in his career. He started out as an academic in Portugal. He uh, then served uh, in government. He was Minister of Finance uh, in 1978. Uh, he then uh, became Deputy Governor of the Bank of, of, the Bank of Portugal in uh, the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and then he returned to academia as Professor uh, of uh, Universidad Católica Portuguesa. Uh, he then became governor of the Bank of Portugal in uh, 1985 and 1986, and then for a longer period, from 2000 to 2009, of course, uh, here we have the euro, and so he was part of the governing council of the ECB as well. Uh, uh, in between, he was member of parliament, and since 2010, he uh, is now member of the executive committee of the ECB, uh, where he acts as uh, vice president of the ECB. So he's at uh, the heart of uh, the difficult policy challenges that Europe faces today, and we are eager to listen to him. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tabellini. I also want to thank the organizers and uh, Bocconi University for inviting me to this uh, important conference, and it is indeed a pleasure to be here with you today. I will, um, I will make some uh, well, lengthy remarks on the uh, topic I have chosen, contagion and the European debt crisis, and uh, as Professor Tabellini just said, I, in the end, I will be available for uh, a short session of uh, question and answers. So, uh, the financial and uh, economic crisis that started in August 2007 uh, is a clear case of the materialization and propagation of uh, systemic risk. The banking crisis reached a climax in September 08 uh, with the demise of Lehman Brothers and the subsequent support to the financial system. In, sp in spring 2010, it turned into a sovereign debt crisis, and we are now in a situation where widespread in instabilities reached new heights. So uh, in, in my speech, I would like to address the phenomenon which is at the very center of what we are experiencing in the euro area the phenomenon of uh, contagion. Uh, contagion is one of the mechanisms uh, by which financial instability becomes widespread uh, that a crisis reaches uh, systemic dimensions. Uh, the other two mechanisms that constitute sources of systemic risks are the unwinding of financial imbalances and the occurrence of severe macro shocks. I will argue that contagion phenomenon uh, play a crucial role in exacerbating the sovereign debt problem in the euro area. As a consequence, crisis management by all com com competent authorities should focus on the policy measures that are able to contain and mitigate contagion. As a cons uh, uh, several of the ECB's interventions uh, have been motivated uh, precisely by the need to address contagion which impairs our ability to maintain price stability in the euro area. By focusing on contagion today, I do not mean to say that other sources of systemic risk do not play any role in the instabilities we are currently uh, experience. Uh, of course, uh, quite the contrary. Uh, an important role is also played by the unraveling of widespread financial imbalances, which contaminated fiscal balances. As I go along, I shall first look at contagion conceptually. I will discuss its meaning from a policymaker's perspective against the background of the academic literature. I shall then dwell in some depth on the evidence of contagion phenomenon and risks in the euro area uh, government debt crisis. 
Next, I shall look at some historical episodes where sovereign contagion also played some role and uh, see what we can learn from them. Finally, before concluding, I will refer to the ECB's policy responses and more broadly, European policy responses uh, to contagion. Broadly speaking, financial contagion refers to a situation whereby instability in a specific market or institution is transmitted to one or several other markets or institutions. There are two ideas underlying this definition. First, the wider spreading of instability would usually not happen without the initial shock. Second, the transmission of the initial instability goes beyond what could be expected from the normal relationships between markets or intermediates, for example, in terms of its speed, strength, and scope. Contagion is crucial for policy making. This is in particular the case because it usually constitutes an externality in the economic meaning of the term. The actions of economic agent A adversely affect the situation of economic agent B. These effects are external to the economic agent A, but the economic agent B cannot make A pay for them. Hence, the price mechanism will not solve the problem. There is a market failure that policy should try to address. In particular, in financial markets, where many agents interact at high frequency, it is difficult for economic agents to get together and negotiate a contractual solution to the externality problem, as uh, Ronald Coase has suggested in other uh, contexts. Uh, in particular, of course, in the, 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 in the financial crisis, uh, this would be even, uh, of course, uh, more difficult or impossible. Contagion, as I have just defined, it is, is in principle distinct from other forms of systemic instability, notably the unraveling of our spread imbalances and aggregate shocks, causing simultaneous failures or crashes. But if imbalances or aggregate shocks already weaken the system, then the different transmission channels can interact, and contagion may well become much stronger than in the absence of such additional vulnerabilities. This is likely to be relevant in the present context, where many financial intermediaries have not as yet overcome their problems and fiscal deficits and debt levels are relatively high. It is probably fair to say that uh, an inherent problem in the literature is that it is difficult to identify empirically the presence of pure forms of contagion. This identification problem is not unexpected, as there are so many factors that could also cause the follow-up problems observed, and it is so difficult to control for all of them. Criteria that have been used in the literature to identify contagion include uh, the following. Uh, first, the transmission is in excess of what can be explained by economic fundamentals. Second, the transmission is different from regular adjustments observed in quiet times. Third, the events constituting contagion are negative extremes. And fourth, the transmission is sequential, for example, in a causal sense. But there is no agreement about which ones of these four criteria are necessary or sufficient to characterize a contagion event. Against this background, ECB staff has developed and is using a series of state-of-the-art analytical tools to assess contagion risks. But these tools often face the same identification problem as the previous literature. Nevertheless, policymakers should hack to stem pure contagion risks if data or analytical tools show sizable spillover risks and there is no convincing evidence that this is caused primarily by economic fundamentals or common shocks. Let me precisely now turn to the evidence from the ongoing debt crisis and I will start by reviewing the evidence of contagion across Euro area government debt markets. When Moody's downgraded Portugal on 5th of July, it cited, among other factors, developments in Greece. 
Moody's believed that the contagion from a default of Greece made it more likely that Portugal would require a second round of official financing. Moreover, referring to Greece as a precedent, Moody's indicated that the second round of official financing would entail private sector participation also in Portugal. Unfortunately, this, is, this was not the end of the story. The downgrade of Portugal and above all, the continuing fears of a Greek default in the market apparently triggered a sell-off in Spanish and Italian government bonds. There had not been adverse data releases concerning the Spanish and Italian economies or budgetary situations around that time. By 18th of July, Italian government bond yields had increased by almost 100 basis points while Spanish ones had increased by more than 80 basis points. What mechanism triggered these market moves? I believe it is fair to say that contagion played a major role. The initial rises in bond yields can be largely explained by the concerns raised by the scope and possible extent of the private sector involvement in Greece, which was set as a condition for a second program at the Euro Area Summit of 21st of July. Some investors may find it rational to start shortening sovereign debt and others simply to reduce their exposures to countries in the currency union since market concerns about government debt sustainability can become self-fulfilling if not tackled in time. Some other investors may also prefer to withdraw from some market segments in view of high volatility. Reduced demand leads to falling prices, which in turn reduces the value of bonds held by other investors, and so on. Investors may prefer to reduce exposures while their positions are still in positive territory or to take small losses early so as not to be exposed to potentially large losses or high volatility later. Markets may then also become illiquid, which can further increase the downward pressure on bond prices. Falling bond prices translate into higher yields, which worsens debt sustainability prospects for those governments which have significant funding needs, thus validating investors' expectations. Well, this is merely anecdotal evidence of contagion. I therefore would like now to uh, use some elements of the ECB staff's analytical toolkit in order to take a more system, systematic look at the data. The first approach estimates the extent to which the deterioration uh, or improvement in the sovereign CDS spreads for three countries uh, with a stabilization program supported by the European Union and the International Monetary Fund, Greece, Ireland and Portugal, affected the CDS spreads for Italy or Spain. <clears throat> the spreads are estimated in two steps using multivariate frequency decompositions. First, the pattern of each CDS spread is ascribed to long, medium and short run shocks. Second, the long and medium run shocks which produce lasting effects for Greece, Ireland, and Portugal are used as additional explanatory variables in the models of the CDS spreads of Italy and Spain over and above their respective uh, own shocks. If this addition into the model leads to a, a statistical significant improvement in the forecast accuracy over a 100-day horizon, uh, we will denote this as a contagion effect. In 2010, these contagion effects accounted for already 37% of the variability observed in the Italian CDS spreads. The impact of contagion became much more relevant in 2011. As of mid-April 2011, the contagion effects acquired a trend-like shape, signaling that they were poised to be long-lasting. The significance of the contagion effects uh, more recently increased to more than 60%. Uh, the model thus provides evidence that the observed deterioration in Italian and Spanish CDS uh, markets, especially after July uh, 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 this year, can be explained to a, larger ex to a large extent by contagion effects from the three program countries. 
Since these results and the interpretation I just gave might be dependent on the specific model used, let me consider another, very different approach. In this other model, government bond yield spreads can switch between a low-level normal regime and a high-level crisis regime. The likelihood of going from normal times to a crisis or vice versa is affected by three determinants. First, markets' perceptions of the sustainability of a country's fiscal position. Second, markets' general risk aversion. And third, direct cross-country interactions, which I shall uh, designate as contagion effects. Estimating the model for Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, Spain, and France suggests, for example, that contagion effects to Italy are much more pronounced after the Lehman crisis than in the previous period and have also increased consistently uh, from 2009 onwards, onwards uh, to levels uh, above 20% according to this model. In the third model, a country's government bond spread vis-à-vis uh, -vis Germany is regressed on a measure of risk aversion, a measure of own sovereign solvency risk, the country's credit rating, and the spillover effect from Greece captured by the credit ratings on the, Greece sovereign, on the Greek sovereign debt. Results confirm that besides general risk aversion and own credit risk, also the Greek credit rating affected other euro area countries' bond spreads in a statistically significant way, in a small magnitude for some countries such as France, and in a large magnitude for other countries as Ireland, Spain, Italy, or Portugal. These contagion effects are more pronounced for countries with, of course, uh, comparatively uh, weak fundamentals. Let me, let me now turn to the evidence on contagion between government debt markets and banks. In July this year, sovereign tensions spread not only to Italy and Spain, but also to banks exposed to the sovereign debt of these countries. The sovereign crisis has clearly affected funding availability and funding costs for individual banks in the euro area. The coincidence of the sovereign debt problems and banks' funding problems constitutes only anecdotal evidence. Additional evidence can be obtained by applying the frequency decomposition model, the first one uh, I mentioned before, to bank CDS premia, uh, to, to bank CDS uh, premia, yes. This shows that uh, from the beginning of April 2011 onwards, developments in the CDS spreads of Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, and France explain an increasing share of the variability in CDS spreads of, for example, Société Générale and Crédit Agricole, whose CDS spreads doubled from early July to mid-August. However, the two banks' exposures to Greece or any other of the program countries did not increase during these months. In other words, contagion effects from government debt markets to banks, as defined in the model, have become more important in recent months in the euro area. Overall, there seems to be significant evidence to actual contagion effects during the European sovereign debt crisis, despite the policies aimed at containing the spreading of instability. Note, however, that uh, there may be latent contagion risks that have not yet materialized. It is quite likely that if the various crisis management measures had not been taken, contagion would be much more severe than presently observed. Before I turn to the uh, ongoing European policy responses to contagion, I would like to look back and consider uh, what one can learn from some historical episodes. A first step is to consider the relationship between uh, fiscal developments across countries in monetary unions when accompanied by political integration, uh, although differences to the present European situation, of course, are uh, very evident. Michael Bordeaux and uh, uh, his co-authors observe a common pattern in the experiences of the United States, Canada, Germany, Argentina, and Brazil during the 19th and 20th centuries. 
Successful fiscal federalism seems to, be, seems to have been associated with explicit or implicit no bailout clauses, constitutional restrictions, and through dis uh, uh, discipline exercised by financial markets for government debt. In the case of the US and Canada, the adoption of fiscal federalism entailed a shift of state debt onto federal hands. For the US, this was achieved uh, in the aftermath of the Re Revolutionary War through a plan developed and executed by Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton's plan transferred state debts accumulated during the Revolutionary War to the federal budget. In addition, it also converted state debts into bonds and established a sinking fund uh, in which revenues were co collected to finance bond purchases on the open market. In this way, the US created an efficient uh, uh, way to smooth fiscal revenues over time and managed to tap into the bond market at reasonable rates. Another interesting experience, albeit uh, again uh, different in terms of environment, is the Italian unification of 1861, uh, when the kingdom of uh, Sardinia integrated uh, with other previously independent states. One of the first decisions of the newly constituted finance ministry of the Italian kingdom was to underwrite all the outstanding debts of the integrated states. The insight that may be gained from these histori historical examples is that a well-functioning monetary union requires strong and innovative approaches to deal with regional fiscal problems. This includes appropriate incentives for keeping public deficits uh, under control, also in a low interest rate environment, and effective means for dissipating contagion, uh, uh, contagious sovereign solvency concerns. Uh, let, of course, me uh, underline uh, a word of caution, all of these historical examples and others mentioned in the paper by Bordeaux um, uh, are ones in which the political union was in place uh, at the time of the monetary union. Uh, this implies, of course, totally different uh, uh, approaches uh, when this is not uh, the case. Another relevant historical episode of significant contagion risks is the Russian sovereign debt default of August uh, 1998. These events started, at, uh, uh, the, started a dramatic chain reaction, which included the subsequent failure of the hedge fund long-term capital management. As Russia defaulted and its currency collapsed, so did its domestic banking system. The stress spread across the globe, and the number of international investors, in particular financial institutions, made large losses. Stock prices dropped sharply across emerging markets and the developed world. As security prices fell, the capital of investors and financial firms was eroded, liquidity withdrew from markets, volatility increased, and credit spreads for sovereign debt widened globally, abruptly, and simultaneously. The Russian crisis did not lead to a financial meltdown. First, central banks around the world provided ample liquidity to market participants. Uh, second, central banks helped in coordinating the actions of market participants, such as the eventual bailout of uh, LTCM by the private sector. Arguably, central bank actions in the fall of 1998 prevented the worst. I now turn more specifically to policy actions in the euro area, precisely, addressing the sources and propagation of the debt crisis. I start with the ECB and then move to the responsibilities of other public authorities. In order to secure the working of the monetary policy transmission mechanism, which is essential for the ability of the ECB to maintain price stability over the medium term, we drew on a number of non-standard uh, non-standard monetary policy measures introduced over the course of the financial crisis uh, that had started in the summer of 07. The measures taken have overall contributed to stabilizing financing conditions and the flow of credit to the economy, all with the view to maintaining price stability. Following the outbreak of the crisis in August 07 and its dramatic worsening in September 08, 
The ECB provided liquidity in more uh, varied ways and at the longer terms in order to address dysfunctions in the money market. It also cooperated with other central banks to contribute to an international response uh, to an international money market problem. The joint provision of US dollar liquidity by initially three central banks, including the ECB, and later by many more central banks was labeled by uh, some observers as the Plaza Accord for Money Markets. In the aftermath of the failure of Lehman Brothers, the ECB launched its policy of enhanced credit support, a series of measures to enhance the flow of credit above and beyond what could be achieved through policy interest rate reductions alone. These measures include the unlimited provision of liquidity through fixed rate tenders with full allotment, the provision of liquidity at length and maturities of up to one year, and the provision of more liquidity in foreign currencies to euro area banks and of euro liquidity to other central banks for them to provide to their local banks and the program of purchases of covered bonds. As banks can only made, make use of the ECB liquidity providing facilities if they, are, if they have sufficient collateral, the ECB also extended the list of uh, uh, assets it accepts as uh, collateral. As it had been the case in the years before the crisis, we also adjusted collateral eligibility uh, in view of market developments in order to remedy evolving inconsistencies and avoid possible abuses. The total value of eligible collateral is very large. It equals about 14 Euro, 14 trillion euros, which amounts to about 150% of euro area GDP. From this total, which is potentially eligible, the euro area banks have in their balance sheets about 4 trillion. With uh, 1.7 trillion <clears throat> of those already approved for utilization uh, in monetary operations, which, uh, of course, creates the necessary room for maneuver in our liquidity provision that right now amounts to just uh, about 570 million. So you see there is a lot of uh, leeway and possibility of uh, providing liquidity with our, in our present mode of uh, uh, full allotment. Facing the repercussions of the euro area government debt crisis, the ECB established also the Securities Markets Program under the SMP, the euro system buys securities in dysfunctional debt market segments in order to safeguard the transmission of monetary policy. This framework has en enabled the ECB to quickly respond to the market tensions resurfacing over the summer of this year. Let me briefly recapitulate the most recent measures. On 10th of August, the ECB again, has again provided liquidity at a maturity of six months. On 15th September, the ECB has announced three additional US dollar operations with a maturity of about three months, which cover the end of the year. Importantly, the ECB has, in response to disorderly conditions in euro area debt securities markets, resumed the active implementation of the SMP on 8th of August to buy sovereign debt securities. The SMP aims to create a better functioning transmission mechanism of monetary policy to all parts of the monetary union and is in full compliance with the prohibition of monetary financing. The relative size of the program, representing just 1.7 of the euro area GDP against, for instance, 13.7 of GDP that has been bought by the Bank of England uh, of uh, government uh, uh, bonds or the 11.4 purchased by the US Federal Reserve. This relative uh, size makes it easier, of course, uh, uh, to be fully sterilized. On the other hand, at the recent October 6 meeting, the ECB decided to conduct two further one-year LTROs to continue to apply fixed rate full allotment procedures in all monetary policy liquidity providing operations for as long as needed and at least until the middle of 2012. 
and to conduct a second covered, uh, covered bond purchase program with an intended purchase amount of uh, 40 billion and over a period of one year starting next November. All of these actions had clear positive impacts in line with their objectives. If we look at the past experience, the ECB, ECB's measures have enabled the monetary policy transmission mechanism to continue operating relatively well at the level of the euro area, containing also contagion, although it should be recognized that the transmission mechanism remains severely disrupted in some euro area countries. ECB action, well, ECB action was fast, targeted, and decisive. But we cannot shoulder the burden of solving the problems alone. The euro area governments have to live up to their responsibilities. First, in the context of the recent agreements about improving the economic governance of the EU, governments need to adopt and implement ambitious medium-term fiscal consolidation plans and introduce structural reforms restoring the basis for competitiveness and growth of uh, their economies. In this context, the ECB also welcomes the adoption of the so-called six-pack uh, of new rules of governance for the euro area, which was recently uh, uh, the result of an agreement uh, between the European Council and the European Parliament. Looking ahead, we all have a need to remain very ambitious in reinforcing economic governance in the euro area. Moreover, obviously, EU IMF program countries need to stick particularly closely to the commitments made. Second, following the intensification of the euro area government debt crisis in May 2010, the Euro Area Member States decided to create the European Financial Stability Facility, the EFSF, uh, and the, the EFSF enables financing of Euro Area Member States in uh, difficulty where financing is subject to conditions negotiated with the Troika consisting of the EU Commission, the IMF, and the ECB. The adjustment program over time improves economic fundamentals and thus dissipates solvency concerns which in turn enables the country to return to markets in due time. On the 21st of July, the Euro Area Heads of State and Government reaffirmed their commitment to ensure the financial stability of the whole area and of its member states and decided to improve the effectiveness and flexibility of the EFSF, particularly with regard to address contagion. The reform adopted at the summit enables the EFSF to act on the basis of precautionary programs uh, to finance recapitalization of financial institutions through loans to governments, also uh, in countries that are not uh, uh, already with programs, and intervene in primary and secondary markets on the basis of an analysis of the ECB and the mutual agreement of member states. Many countries have already ratified these agreements of the 21st of July, and it is of utmost importance, of course, that the final ratifications are concluded and all elements are regularly, regularly implemented. The ECB considers uh, as essential that governments swiftly implement the new instruments of the EFSF in line with the head of state and government's decision of the 21st of July. In this regard, it is overall absolutely crucial that the FSF will have the capacity to fulfill its function for safeguarding financial stability in an effective manner. This implies, in my view, that in order to maximize its efficiency, the EFSF resources would be dedicated to enhance sovereign debt new issuance of securities, thus multiplying their effect. It would be less efficient to spend most of the funds available in the secondary market or in supporting banks' capitalization. Capitalization of banks is, of course, important, but what is at the moment more important for the FSF to do is to provide support to new bond issuance by, for instance, Italy or Spain. At the same time, it is essential that the effective, affected governments do not see the implementation of the new stabilization tools 
as uh, uh, incentives to weaken their efforts of strengthening their financial positions. Rather, it is crucial that all support measures, be it in the form of loans or security purchases, are subject to strict conditionality regarding fiscal budget measures and structural reforms to increase the economic growth uh, that it is so essential to stabilize the debt ratio. Let me now conclude by reiterating a few main messages that I wanted to convey today. First, long historical experience suggests that central banks have an important role to play in contributing to financial stability, including containing con contagion risks. They can do so by providing an anchor for stability through delivering on their primary objective of price stability, by providing as much liquidity as quickly, as widely as, as needed, and by providing analysis and coordination to other policymakers and market participants. Second, in, this, in the context of its, uh, of its systematic risk surveillance, the ECB spends significant resources in identifying and assessing contagion risks. No matter how difficult it is to collect all the relevant information and to design the appropriate analytical tools, most pieces of evidence point to the existence of very significant financial and sovereign contagion risks in the euro area at the present juncture. Third, containing such contagions is of great importance for overcoming the ongoing European debt crisis. There would be enormous economic and social damage if the ECB and other competent authorities do not respond appropriately and decisively within their respective mandates. Fourth, while the ECB's action has been decisive and effective, this alone is not enough. All parties need to live up to their responsibilities. It is of utmost importance that the agreements of the heads of state of go or governments of the Euro area uh, institutions uh, uh, in the summit of the 21st of July are honored and rigorously implemented. This concerns particularly the ratification of the reform of the FSF by all member states uh, that have not yet done so. Moreover, all countries should meet their fiscal targets and introduce structural reforms that restore competitiveness and growth potential. If all parties honor their commitments, I'm sure that Europe will successfully weather these difficult times. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> and uh, as foreseen, now I am uh, available for a few questions. Please. Well, I, I don't believe there are no questions. <laughs> yes, there is a question over there. Okay. I'll take the responsibility to break the ice. Ah, very good. <laughs> Francesca Campolongo, I work in the uh, research center of the European Commission. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, my, my uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this very interesting speech and uh, you uh, have been focusing on the problem of contagion, which is definitely a major problem. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to um, have you here, given your experience, uh, to understand what is uh, your view about uh, the recent proposal in the UK, coming from the Vickers report, uh, to somehow um, protect from contagion, uh, the retail banking sector creating the ring fence which separate uh, the retail banking sector from investment banking. Do you think this would be an effective uh, measure to actually protect them from contagion? Or do you see drawbacks uh, in this idea that could be you know, higher than the benefit? What is uh, your view given your experience? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I am, uh, by answering, I am, of course, uh, a little bit outside uh, um, the ECB's uh, remit on these issues, but I won't uh, shy away of giving you my personal view. 
uh, without uh, committing, say, uh, the institution or, or uh, anyone else. Um, well, in general, I uh, tend to agree with the, the, the main uh, gist of the Vickers uh, report. Um, I see the merits uh, of these uh, sort of ring fencing, the more uh, traditional activities of retail banking. Um, it's not a complete separation because, as you know, it's within the same banking group and also in what regards uh, corporate banking for big firms, uh, uh, there is still the overlap. Both sides can do that. Uh, but okay, it's uh, um, something that can um, build more protection and uh, also build the confidence and reassurance in the part of the uh, banks, clients, and so on. Uh, so I, I tend to, to agree uh, with, with the approach. Although I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, uh, it is a solution to everything, in the sense that if some think that by uh, having this separation, it's not a separation in the Vickers approach, but okay, uh, this ring fencing. If some think that uh, if there is a crisis, then only the retail banking part would benefit from the support of the government uh, and taxpayers' money, and the rest, which is designated by some as the casino part uh, of banking, would not be supported at all. Uh, I have some doubts if uh, that can, can happen, if it is just one institution that is at stake, but of course, in the context of a global crisis as the one that we have been living since 08, I don't think that the uh, approach of narrow banking, which is more or less uh, what is behind this idea, can really work. Because uh, what would happen to all the rest of the financial sector would be so important and would have so many spillovers that it could not be ignored, just ignored. So I think that some put too much hope on these uh, type uh, of, of arrangement. Uh, but I see merit in the arrangement if we understand its limitations also at the same time. <clears throat> yeah. um. Governor Constantino, thank you very much for your remarks, and I really uh, agree with you that the issue of contagion is extremely important and potentially uh, destabilizing. What I would like to do is uh, kind of to dwell on your remarks a little bit to, um, to request you to make a better distinction between contagion and uh, counterparty exposures. So to the extent that if some of the uh, correlations or the st statistics that you cited in your remarks reflects the rational repricing of the underlying securities by the market participants due to their revaluations of the probability of default and the recovery rate. So how do you make the distinction between the solvency issues versus a pure liquidity issues? And in some way, I think this is kind of like a more fundamental way of addressing how the market participants seem to uh, be saying about which countries' sovereign debt may have a different kind of uh, outcome going forward, as opposed to a uh, irrational contagion that academia policymakers seem to fear about. In other words, if that kind of contagions can be rationally explained through the market pricing process, is that something that policymakers should think about or should worry about, or the other kind of contagions that is more uh, due to extreme risk aversion, so just a, 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 a irrational one? Well, if I got uh, correctly um, your question, uh, you are right in saying that what I call contagion in some cases is the effect of uh, um, uh, new assessments of uh, uh, risk uh, uh, of counterparties and so on. Of course, that's the way it plays, but it is uh, nevertheless also true 
that disease contagion in the sense that those reassessments are provoked by what happens to a particular country or counterparty, even if no new events or data are available about the others. That was uh, clear to see this uh, summer, uh, when in fact, suddenly, um, there was a change, a total change in the spreads and CDS uh, in the cash market and uh, uh, CDS premia of Italy and Spain, uh, when there was absolutely no change in the fundamentals of the, those two countries or their banks, uh, nothing has changed except that, in my view, what happened in July, which was the, when the market realized that, in fact, there was going to be a private sector involvement in Greece. That, uh, uh, after all, a sovereign debt of an euro area country uh, would, could and would entail costs for the private sector. That was, of course, in a way, a game changer because that led many market players to reassess the risk of other countries without anything having changed in what regards the fundamentals of those other countries. That's contagion. Of course, it acts through a revision of the uh, risk assessment that is made by the market players, but it is contagion in this sense. And I, uh, I think that uh, the, uh, um, it was only in July that the market could be more or less sure that private sector involvement for Greece was on the table, was going to happen. Uh, and that, in my view, was uh, really a game changer uh, in what regards the contagion in the euro area countries and banks uh, as a whole. It started there and all the data uh, indicate that uh, very clearly, uh, in my view. <clears throat> Morning. Uh, Stefano Stangoni, in San Paolo. I'm the head of financial institution in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question related to the liquidity situation. Uh, I think that situation among uh, the trustee among banks in this situation is very low. Uh, and uh, most of the liquidity banks uh, has uh, now had deposit with uh, Fed or BC. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, interbank deposit market is no more longer, no possibility to negotiate maturity than uh, overnight maturity. So the question is, uh, how much this situation in, about liquidity will impact on possibility from ECB to transfer the monetary policies stimulus to the economy or if the situation will impact negatively on, uh, uh, to, uh, to impact on uh, aggregate like credit to the economy in the lack of uh, liquidity. So, and if yes, what are the the, the, uh, the, 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 the actions uh, that the ECB is doing to uh, stimulate and to restart the interbank model, market. The second question is about the contagion uh, related to the retail deposit market. Uh, at what stage we are or if there are any uh, practical evidence in terms of uh, what is the critical moment uh, once uh, the contagion could uh, impact uh, to the uh, deposit market. Uh, uh, there is evidence in the past that the most uh, deep crisis uh, uh, in the past were once uh, that the deposit yeah. retail market was affected. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Yes, you are right. Uh, the interbank market uh, is um, impaired uh, now, uh, much less so than after Lehman, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the indicators you mentioned are, are clear. Deposits with the ECB uh, are now above 200 billion. 
so banks are borrowing from the ECB and at the same time uh, uh, making deposits in the ECB, just keeping their liquidity buffers available and not uh, uh, lending in the money market. Uh, that is true, it's a sign of tension there and um, missing trust uh, uh, among the banks. But that is true, but at the same time one can say that overall, uh, in the short term and now also up to one year, we are providing liquidity in an unlimited way. We will provide liquidity uh, with full allotment um, and uh, with the two new uh, one-year operations, one in, uh, uh, one, in October, uh, one in November and another one in December, uh, banks can uh, uh, have liquidity which will go beyond the end of 2012. And as I mentioned, overall, there is more than enough collateral in the European banking system to obtain the liquidity that the banks would need. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the bank's balance sheet in the euro area as a whole have almost 4 trillion euros of eligible collateral. And whereas the present level of total lending uh, by the uh, euro system is 570. So you see there is uh, a lot of room there. Of course, the distribution of uh, uh, eligible collateral is not homogeneous. And so there are banks uh, and banks in some countries uh, that don't have much collateral. But that's the overall situation. So I would say that uh, uh, in principle, if that would be the only problem, liquidity, I would say that the economic activity in the euro area as a whole would not be affected by a lack of liquidity. There are many other uh, problems, of course, um, not only on the demand side of credit in view of the economic weakness and slowdown, but also uh, on the part of the uh, risk assessment policy of the banks constraining supply to some uh, uh, segments and so on. So many other factors uh, beyond liquidity are at play uh, in what regards the relationship with the economy. So I would say it's not liquidity that will create uh, those limitations that would lead to uh, acceleration of the economic slowdown. Um, well, as I said, in some countries, banks uh, are in a different situation in terms of not having uh, really too much uh, collateral available, but that's not the case of Italy, that's not the case of uh, uh, many other uh, important countries in the Euro area, uh, as the figures clearly show. Um, but there is this situation of mistrust uh, among the banks. Yeah, it's uh, the consequence of the crisis of confidence that was created by the uncertainties surrounding the uh, uh, solution for the sovereign debt uh, problem. And uh, if it is going to be solved, uh, when and how, uh, all that is important and has created, of course, this period of uncertainty that hopefully uh, will be uh, cleared up until the end of this month. Uh, um, as uh, yesterday, uh, the heads of uh, state and government of uh, two uh, important countries just uh, uh, said. So let's hope that this will be the case and that uh, the markets can see with more clarity what Europe is going uh, to do exactly to deal uh, uh, with the problem. Um, regarding contagion of deposits, uh, no, there are no, no signs of that uh, no, right now. Um, and uh, it is not detect detectable in the, the data that this uh, is uh, uh, a problem uh, right now, it's not. Uh, I agree, of course, that uh, in uh, the more dangerous uh, crisis, uh, of course, the final element is when depositors start to lose uh, confidence uh, in the banking sector. But uh, we are very, very far away from, uh, from that and there, are, there is no evidence uh, whatsoever in that respect.
Andrea Sironi from Bocconi. Yeah. I, I'd like to get back to the issue of liquidity. My question is related to the new requirements that have been introduced oh. by the Basel Committee. And the point is, uh, it seems to me that uh, those requirements uh, actually very much focus on the uh, eligibility at the central bank in terms of the high quality liquid assets. And at the same time, they penalize in some way the interbank credit lines, quite correctly, because the underlying idea is that, of course, of contagion. But at the same time, one would wonder whether this type of uh, uh, approach could, uh, in the future, in some way, uh, give a priority, prior, priority role of the central bank in terms of liquidity provider and, uh, in some way, depress the interbank market. So I wonder whether that situation you were describing earlier is really a temporary one only or whether these liquidity requirements are going to affect that in some way in the future. If you look at the, the data, it seems to me that while there is a lot of focus on the capital requirements, most of the large banks do already comply with them and the situation is a bit different with respect to the liquidity requirement. Most large banks are still uh, below the, at least a large number of large banks are still below the the 100%, especially as far as the LCR is, is concerned. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they are not supposed to be, according to Basel III. Basel III uh, contemplates a transitional period. These uh, uh, liquidity ratios, both the LCR and the net stable uh, uh, ratio, um, are starting uh, after the end of next year. They will be under an observation period and they will may be made compulsory uh, later on, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, 2016. So uh, banks are not yet uh, uh, compelled to uh, comply with those uh, liquidity ratios. Um, there are Many discussions uh, going on, and of course the observation period uh, is there precisely to observe how it works. Um, so the banks are supposed to uh, start complying uh, from 2011 onwards, and then it will be observed it, if it works well before making it uh, fully uh, compulsory. So, um, you know, time for certain reviews uh, is, is still there, it's still foreseen, and that uh, may happen. Uh, banks, uh, in general, have been uh, um, criticizing these uh, liquidity ratios at, as being too uh, demanding uh, and costly uh, f for the banks, but of course, uh, the experience of the crisis also um, proves that uh, this is necessary, uh, of course, that liquidity buffers must uh, be increased. And then we can discuss the composition of the numerator of those, uh, of those uh, liquidity uh, ratios. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, government debt uh, is the more privileged privilege, uh, uh, asset to be in the numerator of uh, uh, the LCR, uh, for instance. Um, well, in view of the sovereign debt crisis that is now, uh, say, disputed and discussed, so revisions may, may still come uh, in, uh, in that uh, respect. But I think it's, uh, it's necessary and the banks have to prepare, have to be prepared to have more liquidity available uh, with all the consequences that that entails, okay, uh, of course. Uh, by, by definition, liquid assets earn less than other assets, so it, uh, it uh, impacts um, revenues, uh, but that's the way it has to be. Uh, and I don't think that there is, uh, say, an exaggeration in what regards uh, what Basel III came up uh, with. Um, but adjustments can still be made uh, to the composition uh, of uh, both the two liquidity ratios. Okay, I think that uh, we are on time according to the program. Thank you very much for your questions.